Welcome to Design Domination, where you'll learn to become a better, more business-savvy designer so you can dominate your competition. Hi, and thanks for tuning in. I'm Colleen Grotzer, and in this episode of Design Domination, I've got Jacob Cass. Stick around to hear about Jacob's journey, his logo design and presentation process, adding more value with brand strategy, and some amazing marketing tips. And find out why Jacob calls himself the Pink Cow. Jacob Cass is a prolific graphic designer and branding expert who runs the popular design blog Just Creative, which doubles as his award-winning branding and design firm. Jacob helps brands grow by crafting distinctive logos and brand identities that are backed by strategy. He recently rebranded San Francisco and Puerto Rico and also branded New York's Digital District. Other clients have included the likes of Disney, Nintendo, and Jerry Seinfeld. Jacob has spoken at TEDx, been featured in Forbes and Entrepreneur, and has been awarded LinkedIn's Best Of for Branding. For him, design is a lifelong journey of continuously honing his craft, as well as educating other fellow designers to build on theirs, which has allowed him to build a large and loyal following, including his website, which has been viewed over 50 million times. Jacob is an avid traveler and has traveled to 87 countries. Welcome to the podcast, Jacob. It's great to talk to you. Likewise. Thank you so much for having me. I'm very excited to talk to everyone here. Thanks. So 87 countries. Wow. Do you speak any other languages? (laughs) I wish I did. Uh, I speak Australian, so that's kind of a language. (laughs) I actually can't travel by plane. I have issues with flying, but I have a foreign language degree, so I can speak some Spanish and some French, but I can't get to the places to speak it. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. Spanish would be handy. I wish I knew that. If there was one language I wish I knew, it would be that. I picked up a few words here and there, but yeah, it's challenging. Well, so how did you get started as a graphic designer? Good question. I, it was kind of a natural progression for me in terms of what I was attracted to. I think this is a similar story for a lot of designers out there. They're always attracted to art versus science. And I kind of went down that path. And uh, my career advisor actually told me about just graphic design as a career. This is when I was in year 10, so two years before graduating high school or whatever that equals to in the US or UK, I'm not sure. But about that time, I was exposed to that idea of that path and I knew it was for me. So I, I explored what the options were in terms of going to university. And there were not as many courses online back then. There's a lot more information available and resources available these days. But after finding out about university, I decided to do that. Uh, and I went and studied university at the University of Newcastle in Australia for three years. And then after that, I moved to the States. So, yeah. And you focus on branding now, is that right? Yeah, I've always had this attraction to branding, identity design and logo design. And I don't know why, but it was just one of those things that really attracted me in the beginning, especially logo design, because it just encapsulated a whole company's essence into one mark. And I just love that that challenge and idea. And it, that's what really drew me into the whole idea of branding. And these days I'm getting deeper into strategy as well. So that's where I'm at. And yeah, it's just a natural thing. I think people gravitate towards areas that they, they like eventually, and you start to learn more about it and then go down different paths. And that's where I'm at now. Sure. So what do you think focusing on branding has helped you accomplish? Like, are you seen of more as a specialist? Well, there's, branding is a huge topic. I'll, I'll talk about personal branding and how that has helped me sure. uh, build the foundation of my business and really has allowed me to, to grow my business and connect with my clientele and also gain a following on social media and all of that. So branding, underlying principles of branding that applies to all areas. But in terms of personal branding, I kind of built a, a name for myself in terms of, um, I didn't purposely do it, but it was just this path that I went down in terms of providing resources for other people and for free and just educating other people. And because of that, I naturally grew a following. And that's really, this was a while back now, it's pretty common to do, do all that, but it, I, it opened me to the world of, of branding. So by doing that, I kind of established myself as a resource and everything I was putting out was kind of creating credibility and positioning me as an expert in my niche, which was branding and logos at the, at the time. And it's just sharing what you know to to show your expertise. And I think a lot of people are at different stages in their journey when they're doing that and mm-hmm. they're afraid of 
I guess, putting out information, they're afraid that it may not be right or it's not good enough or whatever. And it's important to remember that we all started somewhere. Right. And where I started was I was studying at university and I was putting out what I was learning at university and all my these blog posts and content I was putting out is still on my blog today. It's terrible, <laughs> but it still, it still gets traffic and it, it still gets traffic and it still is the remnants of how I grew my brand. And I'm still doing using that same technique today of just sharing where I'm at with my learning journey. Obviously, my design work has improved and my knowledge has increased, but I'm still sharing what I'm learning. So for example, yes, I, I have done logos and everything in the past, but now I'm going deep into uh, brand strategy and providing a deeper service for my clients. And I'm sharing this journey with people on Instagram and my, my blog as well, and even talking about it on podcasts and YouTube. So it's just a matter of um, sharing your process behind the scenes and where you're at and in your particular journey. So, And do you feel like clients are willing to spend more for the strategy rather than just the logo design? Uh, yes, because there is more value in it if you can properly sell it and talk about it and actually know what you're doing. Yeah. Because there's more value in it for sure. If you think about it, the logo is just the tip of the iceberg or the brand and it's the identity, but right. it's kind of like the paint job of a car. There's no mechanics behind it. And there's no like nuts and bolts. And that's really what the strategy does. It's a blueprint for the brand to grow or the roadmap for them to follow. And that is infinitely more valuable for a brand, especially if you can communicate and educate the client on that, the value of that. So absolutely. So true. Well, now, do you feel like you get more respect from your clients too when you, you know, tell them the strategy? Yeah. Like that you're setting yourself apart from other designers? Yeah. I've had it in the past a year or so, I've had a little shift in how I, I talk about branding and strategy. So I, I always used to do strategy as part of my identity and branding projects. And I would talk about it as a like one big project. And uh, as of recently, I've kind of separated them and now I talk about it as strategy as one phase and then identity as a second phase and then touch points as a third phase. So kind of broken down into three areas versus like a project. And that has gone pretty well that way. And it's a su subtle change, but it does give a different mindset to the client as well. So that has proved successful. So when they come to you, like you were talking about positioning earlier. So when they come to you, they know that this is not going to cost, you know, like $50. <laughs> it's going to be very different from going to Fiverr. So by the time they come to you, it sounds like you've already positioned yourself well, that they are looking at this as an investment rather than like some business expense. A lot, yeah, a lot of that comes down to how you're marketing yourself and the, yeah. on your website because the website's really the portal to you and how you are positioned in the market. So before you even have a call or before they've contacted you, they've done some groundwork to see if they'd actually want to work with you. So you may not even realize it if you're not getting these calls that they've already made a decision they don't want to work with you. So yes, to answer your question, they've made up some decision, but they I don't have prices on my website because every project's different. And right. That I want to talk to the client to understand what their wants are so I can understand what their needs are and identify some solutions or suggest some solutions for them. And well, let's, let's put it this way. They often say, oh, I need a logo. And then you can say, why do you need a logo? And then you'll open this bigger question of they actually need to build their business and they need identity and they need growth and all of that. And then like, oh, well, I have the perfect solution for you. It's brand strategy. So it's a very natural flow. And after you've had these conversations a few times, you will know how to talk about it. And this has taken some time for me to learn, but I'm used to it now. And I think the mindset change between using it as one package versus the three, as I mentioned before, has helped definitely. Now, a moment ago, you mentioned, you know, the steps, you have the strategy and then the logo design and then the touch points. So what is your process when it comes to logo design? Do you show a certain number of concepts? Like some designers are like, I want to show like three to five. And then other designers are like, I'm just going to show one. So do you have a certain number that you go by or does it vary by client? Originally at the start of my career, I'd say like, I give you like five logos, for example. These days I'm just, I don't specify any numbers or anything. I'm, I'm going to give you the solution. So if I need to give them 20 logos to get to that solution, I'll do it. But uh, I'm at a point now where like I can suggest five and have a story behind why these work and how fits in with the brand story and how it, it fits with positioning the market because we've done that more thorough research that you have all this information and 
goals and metrics to compare against, then the sell through is much easier because you haven't done that research. Right. If you're just going in with blind with say 10 logos and like choose one, it's the client doing the work and you're just actually giving them guesswork and you're not actually solving any real problem. You're just doing some nice pretty pictures. <laughs> so Right, exactly. He's throwing it at the wall and seeing what sticks. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. So it's it's doing the the groundwork that helps you really solve their problem and sell through the solution to them. And in terms of my process, so just to give some insights here, yeah, I have a call to action on my website that just they call me. We have a discovery session, a quick one to figure out what their goals are and what they actually need. And then sometimes this goes for 15 minutes, sometimes 45. It just depends on the client and all of that. And then eventually I'll have a proposal. I'll call them when I send a proposal to go through it with them so I present it. I don't do it by email. I used to do that, just send it off and wait for a response. Uh, I found that talking through the proposal is easier to explain everything, especially when it comes to brand strategy. Clients generally don't understand everything involved. Right. And that's our job to explain it to them. So you explain the proposal. You can leave it with them. They'll often ask, oh, how do, when do we get started? Or it's either too expensive or whatever. My proposals often have a couple of different options in them. So it can be tailored to their budget. So you're not like, you're not losing them because you're too high. You can also have a one above or one below. So my free packages have these options. And then they decide which one they want and we can customize it. Then we get into the strategy. We have a call. We discuss all the goals and we figure out the positioning, the customers and I do research into competitors and we kind of do that process for a while. And then we have a, a strategy to come more of a, a written strategy so that we have to refer back to. And then we can get into the fun stuff, which is the design and creativity and all of that, which is dictated by the strategy. I'll send them logos. Often it'll be like, uh, I don't know, it's between, I'd say my average is about five. Sometimes I present one if I'm really like, really confident on it and sometimes i've presented eight to ten if it's like a larger project so for example up front or like you maybe you start with a few and then end up with that many well it depends so sometimes i'm subcontracted out by agencies and i would be like a short list of say 10 logos and then we'll talk about like what's right and we'll cut it down to say three that they may present to the client or we'll revise because that's what we're feeling is right so it depends on the client and like how good the work is so like in the first rounds, I keep things pretty open and I like exploring a lot of different routes to, because it's just, this is how I prefer to work. And I do sketches and I'm very quick on iterating on the computer and just exploring different typefaces and colors. And it's, I think if anyone's seen my process videos, you'll see that like my art boards are just ridiculous in terms of how many <laughs> um, options there are. It just gets overboard. And um, <laughs> I'm not sure how many other people work like that, but that's just how I do it. And then I often come down to, say, five to eight concepts and then dwindle down to three really built out ones. And I can put a logo or identity together on, say, a website or marketing material just to show the brand in context. And then I present that, talk through it on a Skype call or Zoom or whatever it is and go through the presentation with a screen share so I can control the whole process and talk about each of the ideas. And then I'll send the PDF to them after the call and then they have everything to review and then, then we can have another chat they get back to me on email maybe sometimes they decide on the phone like, i want to go this direction sometimes like oh, i want to frankenstein things or <laughs> whatever it is we all will revise the process until it's it's the right look and feel for the brand and then and then we'll keep doing that process until we finalize the, the brand and then we'll uh, move into other collateral once everything's perfected in terms of type and colors and style and everything. And then we can build out the rest of the touch points. But most of the time, I'll, uh, we'll start on the, the logo identity and maybe one or two things in context. I find websites are pretty, like just the header of the website, the hero area is a good way to get a feel for the brand because you're implementing photography, type, color, um, call to actions. So there's a lot of different nuances that you can see. Um, or like a print poster or, or something like that, but they're less used these days. They're not as useful. After that, uh, I sent them all the files and we built out the other touch points as well. And that side of it done. And I'm always there for support afterwards as well. Your artboards sound like my artboards. <laughs> yeah, good, good. I've got a couple on YouTube that I've shared and yeah, they, they get crazy. 
So when you're presenting the logos, I mean, you're saying you're presenting them with some mock-ups. So that leads me to believe that you're showing things with color. And early in my career, I showed logos in color. And then I stopped doing that because it was swaying the client's eye. So I started doing just black only. I mean, we all know that logos have to work in one color anyway, but if I showed a logo design in, you know, like say blue and orange, and then I had another one that's like purple and green, you know, the, it was like they were being led to the design based on the color, not the design. So showing them in black only was keeping their eye specifically on the design. Have you, what are your thoughts on that? Like what's been your experience? So I always show black and white and full color at the end of the presentation. So there'll be two versions of the logo. I'll have all the logos on one page and um, in color and then another page with them all in black and white and at the start of the call i always preface it with that all fonts colors and style can be changed and that color is very subjective so to remove color from the picture but i always find that selling through designs that color can really help to bring it to life especially when you're using it on mock-ups it just depends on the client as well and where you are with the process and how much strategy you've done before because if the strategy is very cohesive you'll know that color is very important and can relate it back to it. Right. If you're not really sure on a few solutions, you could show a couple of colors on a separate page, for example, just to give understanding of like how different it is. And I actually use this technique with different typefaces as well, because I want to communicate that how type is so important when it comes to identity design. And although not everyone's trained in that area, people know what type feels like. Just as if you see like something written in their blood, you know, it's like, <laughs> it's not like, yeah, it's, it's, you just know. So I show different typefaces on one page, especially when it's a type-driven approach. So a lot of like, say, finance companies or fashion companies, there's not often a logo mark. It's just like it's type-driven approach. And I, I like showing the nuances between the different ones and talking about it to show the expertise behind the thinking and just the different avenues you could take. But the reason why I didn't go this one or this direction. So it's a bit of education. It's not right for every client. It can be overwhelming, but you just have to judge it uh, of where they're at with everything. So yeah, just keep that that in mind and be a good judge of, of it. So you said that you work as a subcontractor to some other agencies. So I'm curious how you ended up getting opportunities to work with Nike and Disney and Nintendo and Jerry Seinfeld and San Francisco and in Puerto Rico. I mean, that's amazing. Yeah, there's um, there's definitely different ways of getting them, but Full transparency, a lot of these clients, I was working at an agency full-time, not subcontracted. So the Jerry Seinfeld and Disney and all of that, uh, I was through an agency. So I was working with a team of uh, like a creative director and art directors, developers and all of that. And I was doing the UI UX for websites with them. Then the other ones like Puerto Rico and San Francisco, I was subcontracted by another agency who did all the R&D. R&D for like about nine months beforehand. So that sent me a very comprehensive brief and uh, research studies and interviews and everything. So I had a, a lot to go off. And then I just did more of the identity and logo work. And that was how that job was landed. And they originally found me, well, the agency originally found me through my website and social media profiles. And that's just really about being out there and having your work out there to, to show people what you do. And that's how the agencies find me. So I'm not really reaching out to any agencies. I, I find a lot of people do do that, but I'm in a different position because I have the exposure from my blog and good search rankings. So that particular strategy works for me. But yeah, if you do want to get your work in front of agencies, it is a matter of figuring out what agency works for your work and what agency aligns with your style and where you want to work as well. Just you need to get your work in front of them and establish a relationship to even get uh, an avenue of work from them. If they don't know you, then you're not going to get the work. So Right. Well, how did you end up getting in Forbes and Entrepreneur and Wall Street Journal and to do a TEDx talk? This is all through my blog, Just Creative. And like I, I mentioned at the start of this, this is really about building up my personal brand and being out there and having exposure and right. learning search engine optimization and getting a name out there. So I'm active on all social media and I have tons of content online as well. And because of that, you get seen from other people, from writers, from these magazines and from schools or from conference organizers because you have more exposure you get more more opportunities i guess so i got contacted to do a tedx talk when i was 22 or 23 and i was like hell yeah <laughs> i've never had that opportunity <laughs> i've done a, 
a talk ever uh, in front of that many people. Like, wow. Obviously, I've done talks in front of classes of like 20 or 30 students, but not to 400 plus people in a live webcam kind of thing. I was like, okay, yes, I'll step up to the plate. And I'm so glad I did. And I haven't done many talks after, actually, I haven't done any talks after that. I'm not a big public speaking person, but I maybe should be. <laughs> <laughs> but the thing is, like, when opportunity comes knocking, uh, you just say yes. And it worked out and it brought me clients now. And obviously, it's a uh, a little nice thing to have on your resume and whatnot. So that's how I got that particular opportunity in terms of the Forbes and all of that. It's just being being there and having, well, people want to talk about you. If you share your success and share everything, your story, people want to share that story as well. And it just works for everyone, I guess. Yeah, I'm always telling other designers they've got to write, they've got to get content out there so they can get seen. And then the right clients for them will be attracted to what they're saying. Exactly. You need a, you need a voice. And if you're not speaking, no one, you can't be heard. And with that said, I want to say that you do need to have a particular content strategy in mind. So if you want branded work, for example, or logo design work, your content should be revolved around that and actually serving the customer and helping them versus just here's my work right so for example you may have on your website top five mistakes small business designers make in branding and like of course people want to read that if they're in small business and it's just you can capture their email address and then you can you can send them content and email and really teach them about how they can build their business and obviously have your services in the background but you do need to create that relationship from the beginning offer free value up front uh, nurture them with a lot of other resources. So you can have like a email drip campaign, for example, and give them free resource. And then in the background, have your sales pitch or just a, it has to be friendly. So often there's this um, rule about three to one. So three points of value and then one call to action about your services or whatever. So if you want to see this in action, you can subscribe to my email list and you'll get like a drip campaign of about six different emails, all on branding. Just, and it talks about the values of branding, the benefits and how you can get started. And yeah, you, you can implement that as well. And at, at the bottom of the emails, it's like you can book a, a free call with me if to if you need branding. So that's just one one particular way you could do it. But yeah, this marketing is a, a whole other subject and mm-hmm. <laughs> especially content marketing. We can talk all day about it. Right. <laughs> but just make sure you have a strategy in mind and just don't go like a blanket approach because you waste a lot of time that way because there's a lot of noise. I used to do that, say, like five, 10 years ago, where there was not so much noise and it worked because you could rank easily. But these days, it's, there's just so many other blogs and big websites and publishing firms that it's, it's very difficult. So, Right. So going back to personal branding for a second, one of my listeners, Sean, was wondering how you came up with your brand color of magenta. Yeah, so pink, (laughs) pink or magenta, it's definitely a unique color for a male in the graphic design world or branding world. So that makes me stand out and makes my brand memorable. And it also ties into the name Just Creative. And pink is a very vibrant, vivid color that is creative and it it just works for the brand. And yeah, I love that it's, it's very passionate and bright and vivid. And that's really why I use it. And it, I just, it just works well with white and black, and I, I love it as well. So it's a it's a bold color, and it's it's very confident, especially if you're a male, if you can pull it off, and it stands out. Yeah, yeah, it's great. Well, I see a lot of designers just creating logo designs with colors that they like, but they don't really have a reason behind them, and they don't necessarily appeal to their audience either. But like what you're saying about it's going to get you attention and it's going to separate you from other designers. Like those are great reasons to go with a color like that. Exactly. And yeah, if you've read Seth Godin's book, Purple Cow, it's all about standing out and being that purple cow. So I say I'm the pink cow. (laughs) That's great. So I was wondering if there are any challenges that you've faced or had any self-doubt about and how you overcame them over your career. Well, the TEDx talk I did was actually a big challenge that happened to me. I got, I lost my job in the States and I had two weeks to leave the States because of my visa issues. And my TEDx story talks about the, how I overcame that and how I got a new job and eventually made my way back to New York. I had to fly home to Australia. I got kicked out. I was in Canada for a while because I couldn't get back in. My wife had to bring all my belongings and everything, fly home to Australia. Oh, wow. But I saw a lawyer. Sorry, Laurie, I got a different visa and made my way back just because I love New York and I wanted to to be there. And that really 
pay dividends and I stayed there for five years and that was a huge challenge but it just shows that like uh, it's so possible and like I got a, a new job within a couple of weeks and just by utilizing the network that I had established and the use of social media and personal branding and just showing how beneficial all of that is in terms of overcoming struggles and getting where you want to be and just the possibilities of it. Self-doubt. I think we all have self-doubt and we're all afraid of putting ourselves out there and it's just a matter of doing it and starting that I think that we all just need to do it and get over it because there's nothing that really bad can happen from it. If you fail, it's not really failing. It's just a lesson learned. And that's really about a mindset thing. It's it's just how you think about things and right. being positive and learning from those experiences and not worrying too much and not doubting yourself and just doing it. So uh, I think I just used Nike's tagline there, but mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I think just to start doing it and do it slowly and learn about it slowly and be a sponge with everything that's out there and you can share your journey and you'll grow by doing doing that as well and the more you practice the better you'll be and the less self-doubt you'll have so true i mean i was terrified of starting a podcast (laughs) i didn't want to put myself out there like that so you know look how that's changed (laughs) yeah exactly and there's no video so if you're afraid of video then Podcaster for you, and then uh, yeah, I'm afraid of it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's a good stepping stone. So once after, I'm sure you'll be more confident after maybe a season or two that you'll get into video and you can start sharing there as well. So, um, or you could just start now and stop doing doing the self doubt thing. <laughs> yeah, I'm getting there. <laughs> You've given out such great information. Is there any other advice that you have for aspiring freelance designers that are trying to get more respect? They're trying to charge more. And, you know, a lot of them want to work for bigger clients and they're intimidated. And one of my listeners, Chris, he was asking what you would recommend to designers, you know, right out of school that are trying to build their business. Yes. There's a lot that I can set up, say about this. And in terms of um, designers coming straight out of school, I highly recommend you work for someone else first because you get access to mm-hmm. greater minds around you. You'll learn the business of design and how to do pitches and how to not drawing pitches but like pitching things <laughs> to other other clients and working with team members and learning from those around you so get your foot in the door at an agency or somewhere that you want to to work and and before you go working for yourself but you can still work for yourself while you're at, at an agency so I did that for a number of years I moonlighted I ran my blog just creative it was a side hustle and still took on freelance work so I did too that would be a tip for starting designers in terms of other advice, I, I think a lot of designers focus a lot on, or emerging designers or even established designers are focusing a lot on social media. And to give some insight, like I have a lot of followers on social media, but only 1% of my web traffic actually comes from social media. And the rest is from search engine optimization. So people typing in things into Google. So I'd recommend if you're on social media, have a strategy and goal in place and really establish connections with people and make it about other people and providing value than versus just sharing things about you and me, me, me. It's all about them, 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 them. Yeah. And before you actually go on social media, don't even be on social media unless you have a product and business in place that you can use social media to drive to. So think about social media as a, a little bit of a driving force, but you need a business and a real product or service that you can sell. And really there's, there's no point of being on social media if that there, is there isn't there. So <laughs> for example, if they if you're driving people through your Instagram link in bio, they go to your website and your work isn't or well, your marketing and messaging and position isn't correct, they're not going to hire you or contact you. Yeah, I did a podcast episode about showing up well and consistently online. Yeah, exactly. So keep that in mind and really focus on your product first and your platform versus building up other platforms first because you're going to own your own platform such as your website, and you can control it. So you can control your email list, you can control the content, you control the search rankings, you control everything about your own platform. So focus on your platform the most because that's what the background of your business is going to be and your brand is your platform because you don't know in five years' time or, well, even let's just say two years ago, Facebook had, you could get organic reach on Facebook so easily and you could reach like 100,000 people plus. And these days, even if you have 100,000 people, you're going to reach like 1% to 2% um, or 10%, 10% if it's a viral post. So it, the value of a follower is nothing these days on Facebook. So 
Instagram is, is pretty good right now, but you don't know in a few years time on how that's going to be or the reach There's going to be more noise. And uh, eventually you're going to have to fall back on your platform and have your own user base. And when you say user base, it's, it could be an email list or it could be your own selection of clients and relationships that you've built. And that is where the money's at. So don't focus too much on social media, but uh, your own platform. Great. That's very helpful. So let's remind folks where to find you online. So Just Creative is my website, Just Creative, and you can go on there. There's a something called a branding briefcase, which is my lead magnet, which is how I get people's email addresses. And uh, you can see how I actually market myself and um, how you can establish something similar. But if you just want a free bundle of goodies for something, the lead magnet is called is my branding briefcase. So basically, it's a ton of free resources that you get, um, logo inspiration books, um, design resources, the best design gear, mock-ups workbooks, tools, and everything. It's all free inside there. So um, check that out. It's either my website or brandonbriefcase.com if that's easier. Yeah, and if there's anything you need, just reach out to me or on my handles. They're all just creative. Um, we have a private Facebook group as well, which you can join. But you can get all these links on my, on my main website, Just Creative. Well, this has been great. This is like chock full of information. Thank you. Awesome. If you liked this content, please leave a review and share it on social media. Do you need help enhancing your design skills or working through a freelancing issue? Go to creative-boost.com to apply for design mentoring. Also check out the free resources and join us in the Design Domination Facebook group.